introduce my co-host, Jenilyn Gagatiga. Welcome, Jenilyn, this evening. And also, we have two wonderful guests who are going to Hi talk there. to you. Hi, how are you doing? How are you, Jen? Hi, John. Hi, Maria. Hi, Hi Joan. Hi, Joan Olick and Anthony Kuzloni. How are you? How are you this evening? Joan, how are you? I think we're having a technical issue. Joan? Hello, Joan. Hello, Joan. Jen, how are you, Jen? Hi, Jen, how are you? I'm okay. Yeah, are you can you hear again? John and Anthony? Yeah, I'm back again. Can you hear John and Anthony? Joan? Yes. Can you okay. hear me? Oh, yes. But I, thought I was introducing you, Joan and Anthony. So we just wanted to. Oh. Okay. Um, you know what? We're going to try the technical part again. Jen? Jen? Okay, he can, she can hear you, John. Okay, go she's, ahead. She's just making an introduction to you, John. Yes. Okay, so she'll make a short introduction to you, and then we'll start the questions with regards to what you do. Good. All right. Okay, Joan. go ahead, Maria. Yes, hi, Joan and Anthony. Thank you for joining us this evening. It's Joan Olich and Anthony Kuzloni, and they're both can, can Canadian citizens very much concerned about our property rights. So Joan, I'd like you to let us know a little bit about yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Joan. Well, Maria, I started learning about property rights seven or eight years ago as part of my job. I'm a realtor and I sell farms and mm -hmm. large parcels. And I was not understanding why various groups had authority on private property. And I'm talking about the conservation authorities and the Niagara Scarpet Commission and the Green Belt, all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. How did they get um, rights to control my property or my client's property? So we started Good looking point. into property <laughs> rights and um, we've come a long way. I, I know. I think you and, and uh, Anthony have been at this for eight years, about eight years now, doing your research, which is commendable. Yeah, yeah that's correct. Is that correct? I remember <laughs> you telling me, Anthony, that it's been eight years that you've been studying this this uh, this problem and, uh, and, and these issues that we're having with our farmlands. And I, I'm sure it's not going to be only our farmlands in the future. It's going to be actually our, our properties um, in the cities also. So, Anthony, tell me a little bit about yourself also. Well, I got started on it because um, back in 2013, the town of Grimsby had a comprehensive zoning bylaw review, and uh, they were going to encumber my property because I'm 40 mile creeks my south boundary. And that encumbrance would mean that 120 feet, probably 120 meters from the creek would now be under their uh, domain. I'd have that if I wanted to add deck or if I wanted to do anything in the, in the my property of my three acres, that I would have to get permits and permission. And the issue I had with it was that I purchased the property in December of 1980. And if you bear with me for a moment here, uh, and I go to my deed and it says, to have and to hold onto the said grantees, their heirs and assigns to and for their sole and only use forever. As joint tenants, not as tenants in common, subject nevertheless to the reservations, limitations, provisos, and conditions expressed in the original grant from the Crown. So as you can see, it refers to another document, but what I purchased and that clause in there for my sole and only use, well, if the town's telling me I can't do something with it and the conservation's telling me I can't do, do something with it, I want to understand how they got that authority over the agreement that I entered to, into from the, the previous owner. 
So that's what started it all. Good point. I, I know myself as an advocate that it always starts when you're when you have something that you're not happy with and you feel very strong with, then you start advocating for. So yeah, I, I can understand that. And Joan, what got you started? Was it because you you mainly do a lot of real estate uh, on in the rural uh, section of Ontario? That's right. It's rural properties, and in particular, um, a couple of things didn't feel right to me. So when you think of a farm, a hundred acre farm, for instance. Mm -hmm. And you have a farmer, um, a family rather, who's been on that property for a hundred years. Now that family has grown over time, and perhaps the original uh, patriarch has passed, and perhaps he had two sons, mm -hmm. and perhaps they each had two sons. So now you have um, sort of six adults and their families working the farm. And it takes at least three or four adults to work the farm. The problem is that we can only have one house on a farm, <laughs> particularly in the areas I work. Hello? Hello, Joan? I'm getting playback, Maria. Hi, John. Okay, go ahead, John. You okay? Yeah. That, okay, that, you may continue. Oh, yes. So, when you have a farm and there's a large family that live on the farm and have grown up on the farm and they get married and take wives and what have you, they can no longer stay on the farm because they can't build another dwelling. <coughs> and usually the original farmhouse isn't big enough to hold three or four families. Mm -hmm. uh, if they move off the farm, it means that they have to have a second income, perhaps in town, a job of some sort. That leaves them little time for farming. So it felt like farms were being taken away from farm families yes. <coughs> by not giving them <coughs> the potential to live and work on their own farm. Yes. <laughs> that, does that make sense? It does. Oh, yeah, Absolutely. definitely. Absolutely, yes. And that's my concern, too, yeah. because that's the oh. feeling I get also, Joan and Anthony. Yes. Right. And then and then you've got, so sometimes you have a farmer who's all his sons have moved off the farm because they can no longer live there. But the old farmer still wants to live there. Mm -hmm. The problem is he can no longer maintain 100 acres by himself, and he's now on his own. Yes. So what he'd really like to do is take a 10-acre lot off for himself and sell the rest so that somebody else could farm it, but he can live in the area that he, he's always lived in. Mm -hmm. He can do a little farming and still have money to live. Once again, someone steps in and says, no, you can't do that. Um, it's the municipality or it's the conservation authority or it's the province. Everybody's regulating and controlling private property. He's yes. a private owner. So Tony and I, um, we learned a long time ago that all, all private property is patented. And we started researching these patent grants. And what we've learned is um, pretty extraordinary in that it's available for everyone to know, but nobody seems to know it. Tony <laughs> will tell you that. Well, let's let's start on the basis here that every land document that's held in private ownership makes reference back to the original grant from the crown. And yet, when you ask somebody about it, nobody seems to be able to give you a straight answer. And, and that's the, the basis of what we're trying to do here is try to figure out the intent of the sovereign and how it's morphed into what it is, and can they do that? So. The land was first given to the first settler with conditions, and it, it's the prerogative of, of the sovereign. And it should be clear that the definition of prerogative of the sovereign is to act without accountability to parliament, subject to no restriction. So, I don't understand, and that's the question, how the sovereign can grant a piece of land to someone for their sole and only use, heirs, and a 
signs forever. And then the municipality, who is subservient, comes up and puts an encumbrance on the land. That's where things kind of fall off the rails. Mm -hmm. And when you ask the question, mm -hmm. I cannot get a straight answer. It doesn't matter whether it's the lawyers or the attorney general's office. I, I wrote a letter to them. And if you can imagine, the attorney general's a, a lawyer. Uh, the office has probably 600 lawyers employed. And the response to me was that I should obtain the services of a lawyer. <laughs> well, if most of the lawyers don't have an answer, well, why would mine? So this this is what started the quest. And as we've dug into it deeper and deeper, technically the answer is no one can impede or impair the prerogative of the sovereign. <laughs> uh, our counselors, our judges, our police forces, all officers to the crown, all swear in allegiance to the crown. And yet we put the uh, original grant from the crown in front of them, which tells you what you're entitled to. And they look at it like you've got two heads. And <laughs> nobody will have the problem. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna, I know why they're. I know why they're confused. You need to explain to us and to the public when they say sovereign to the crown. Explain to us what that means. In a layman's term, so everyone in layman's can understand. terms, what does that mean? Well, I think we have to go back to our parliamentary system, and we look at that. We have a, a provincial parliament and a lieutenant governor. Mm -hmm. We have a federal government that has a, a lower house and an upper house of the Senate. And who's head of state? Well, it would be Queen Elizabeth. And Queen there Elizabeth you go. Is of, of the crown. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I was waiting everyone. for. <laughs> that's what I was waiting for. The people that we vote into into power and and our, our, our judges, our elected officials, all. Mm -hmm swear allegiance to the sovereign of the crown. Now, by my way of thinking, anytime you would put down a document, a prerogative, a grant from the crown, it should be respected. Mm -hmm. And if you say, no, we're not going to respect it, then you have to explain to me, you have to show me where they became expressively equal to or above the sovereign. Now, Len Harris, a senator from Australia, made this comment. A river may never rise above its source. So when we look at that analogy and we look at um, the sovereign as being head of state, how do these other government levels, and we're talking municipal levels in most of these parts, who are so subservient, mm -hmm. all of a sudden come up and say, no, you can't build that deck in your backyard. Mm -hmm. Well, why? Well, because we've passed an ordinance. Well, yes. what puts you above the agreement that I have, a two-party contract with the sovereign, heirs and assigns forever, what puts the municipality above that? That's the question I'm trying to ask. Mm -hmm. Well, no, I've asked. But nobody will give me an answer other than say, oh, well, that's all. Well, well, so what? So is the Bible, okay? <laughs> we put your right hand on and swear to tell the truth. Hey, I don't want to get religious here because that's not what this, what yeah, this is about. Exactly, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but if you understand that, well, then the Bible's old. Why are we saying that? Okay. Yeah. It has relevance. Okay. Yeah. So, John and Anthony, going back to the question related to um, everyone's um, probably question is Did you? To know that the municipality have no power or authority on a private property. So when we ask that question, particularly, what could be the summary that we should be doing in order to protect our private property? We shouldn't have to protect our private property, but we do have to learn. We have to know what our rights are. And in order to know what our rights are, we have to obtain our personal land patent. They won't be in our name. What they are is the original letters patent for the property that we own, um, any one of us own, because all private property is patented. Mm -hmm. So the original letters patent can be obtained from either the Ministry of Natural Resources Office in Peterborough okay. or, or the Federal Archives, which is in Gatineau. Um, mm -hmm. And those would be 
um, native lands that were surrendered, generally speaking. Okay. If it's not native, then, then your patent probably resides in Peterborough. So to get a, a true copy of the patent, you just send an application in with your lot and concession. And um, within about three weeks, you will get your patent grant. From there, you're going to do a complete title search because you want to know if any of the uh, predecessors to you gave up any of the rights lawfully because they could give up their rights lawfully. Mm -hmm. So if they made an agreement with the Conservation Authority, that's a right that was given up that probably can never be recovered. But if okay. the Conservation Authority stole a right, took a right, that's a, a that's probably some, a right that the property owner can get back, I would say. Mm -hmm. Because if it wasn't given up knowingly and willingly, mm -hmm. it wasn't given up at all. So, yeah. get your back and have it searched and then and then join our Facebook group because we put a lot of information on there mm -hmm. to explain what your rights are and um, what we're trying to do mm -hmm. to get the courts to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. acknowledge that we have property rights. Okay. And what do you think where would be the most beneficial uh, residential owners for this? Is this residential owners living near the boundary of the Greenbelt or just residential owners residing in the downtown core? Well, the green belt really what it did is it just came and, and blanketed over over private property and, and I said to many people, you know, are you in, in favor of having a green belt? And people would say, oh yeah, sure, I, I, it's a great idea. But when you uh, phrase it in, in the proper context, which is, are you in favor of having a green belt and stealing someone's property to do it? Well, then most people say, well, wait a minute here. Um, <laughs> why would we have to steal someone's property? Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, that's yeah. what's happening. <laughs> so if there are times where we have mostly rural properties or properties that have been established, and all of a sudden the green belt came in and it, it encumbered the property mm -hmm. and, and limited people from using their property. And there's a lot of people that have small parcels under 10 acres that they're not suitable for farming they're just not enough land mass to mm -hmm. farm mm -hmm. they got dragged into it because we basically painted everybody with the same brush now there are in denser locations of the, of the you know the city and mm -hmm. you know, we have builders and developers who actually enter into covenants with, with the municipality we have to remember here that for instance if somebody wants to put a pipeline through your property they don't go to the town and ask, mm -hmm. they go to the private property owner and ask, mm -hmm. and then they enter into an agreement and an easement is given to allow that pipeline to go through. Uh, so the, that private property owner that of, of that utility cannot expropriate the property, they have to get permission. And I, I think Joan was mentioning here that she knew somebody in Burlington that they, they wanted to put a proper, uh, pipeline through, and they did, but the owner had all kinds of requirements. Mm -hmm. inspection mm -hmm. and hours of work uh, you, you name it well it's private property and they had the right to do that um, and, and that agreement once uh, the conditions have been met it carries forward if the owner who granted the easement uh, sells a property the buyer who buys it has to accept that because that person basically granted the right given to them through the through the sovereign through the through the king, in, in, in our case here, King George III, King George IV, and that uh, carries forward <laughs> until a person mm -hmm. who has the easement relinquishes that interest. Interesting, interesting. I'm just going to stop. I'm just, I'm just going to stop here now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to close this segment, and then we're going to start up in about another half hour. So we're going to have more than one second because there's too many questions, and uh, people can only um, absorb so much. So what I'm going to do now, Jen and um, um, Joan and Anthony, is I'm going to close the show up.
and then we're going to re we're going to we're going to continue we're going to take a bit of a breath and we're going to continue because i've got some questions that may take a little bit longer to answer so if you don't mind i'd like to prefer to do that so i'm just going to close the show now and thank very much jenna lynn my co-host and thank you very much olga i'm sorry Joan Olick and John Kolonsky for coming this evening. And we will uh, start part two very shortly. So stay with us. Thanks very much. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Okay, hold on, John. Okay. okay. Yeah, hold on. Okay. Okay. Don't leave Maria. No. Yeah, so we're, we stopped the stream already. Okay, good. Okay.